Morning, President Egon. Boyat Panga ito. Hello, Boyat. How are you? Good, good. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow o taking natin. Oo oh, nga eh. <laughs> <laughs> Meron pa tawa. One full page ad si Executive Director eh. Ganun ba? Yeah, ah. ako naman. I like it because it popularizes the concept eh. Yes. Because up to now, our country, they don't know about ADR. That's it, right. It remains within the realm of lawyers. Even many lawyers don't know. That's right. Ayaw lang nag adr at nakakalam. So, we really have to do a lot of massive uh, campaign. Na. Yeah. Uh, ano, uh, I just hope we'll, uh, our, our, our team, uh, the council, will really be able to help them. Yeah. Like with you, si Teddy and si Professor Gwen, I, let's, let's gently nudge uh, or ADR, especially ngayon, uh, yung kanilang executive director mukhang focus siya. She wants yeah. to accomplish something, di ba? Yeah. Tsaka masipag talaga. Yeah. I think the, the entire team actually masipag. Yeah, they have a new team. Uh, one, and uh, we expect they can do a lot more now. Yeah. Yeah. See, in the past, it was just a series of meetings. I've attended siguro apat na na TWG yeah. niyan eh, since like five yeah, yeah. years ago pa. So hopefully, Nung nandito sa PDRC, it's a fine way of showing uh, partnership among uh, private and IBP. And of course, kayo mga experts yan para. Let's push it forward. Yeah, that, that's right. Tsaka, I'm sure we'll hear concerns and proposals from the various uh, ADR organizations. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm sure like uh, PICCR and the others. But I'm yeah. like, you know, when and, and I'm very thankful to being here and uh, kay Boy. Because early on, even I think when I was EVP, I already talked to Boyle, Satin, and others, and they were very supportive. I think, uh, you know, how, how can we jumpstart this if we disagree with the RCI that has been there for so long a time? Institution na kayo eh. So, you know, it's not exclusive, but I would, uh, I, I would uh, rather work with the these institutions already. You know? Ngayon, yung iba, na gusto rin nila mag, wala namang problema. You know, it's a wide, wa, wide new field. And uh, ano, ang maganda lang ngayon, meron ng mangyayari. Di ba? Na, and yeah. then, uh, ma, ma, magaling naman din ako mag-source out ng funding. So, we really need to fund yung mainstream. Ang mga initiatives nila. Oh. Anyway, we'll be discussing it uh, in greater detail. In, yeah, the, in the coming months. Yeah. Muna. I hope you guys don't mind na uh, launching lang muna ito para ano, yeah, yeah. At, your, at your pace but I prefer para maari you know next year talagang tuloy-tuloy na yeah. yung formal uh, one na training and certification po. That's right. Yeah. Pondo naman eh. May pondo naman na. How can you expect the pro bono lawyer in the provinces to even suggest and uh, resolve things to ADR? Hindi naman nila alam. Yeah. Hindi naman sila accredited. Di ba mga ganun ba? Yeah. A lot of things to do in the coming year. So sige po, uh, unahin lang muna natin ito and then tomorrow yung, uh, yung uh, council naman. Loads lang natin. Ha? Sige. I'll step out for a while. I'll be yeah. back then. Ha? Yeah, yeah. Ako din. Yes, I'll, I'll meet muna. King, okay lang tayo? Okay na tayo? Yes, sir. Okay lang po. Uh, we'll start at 10. Yeah, yung ceremonial signing, I have a copy. We'll just show the signing and then uh, how how that it be done. Yes, sir. Uh, we already I already talked to uh, si Jean and oh. uh, we will we will arrange how the exchanges and the documents will be made yeah, after okay. this ceremony. Yeah, kasi many of the MOAs that I've been signing since the pandemic. Ano talaga? Uh, ceremonial and then we sign and then we show uh, copy and then mga uh, Italian uh, exchanging of signed documents saka na kayo nang bahala doon Opo, and I was told nasa Cagayan, Cagayan daw kayo Okay, ka daw Doubly immunocompromised kasi I'm a cancer survivor eh. uh, uh, I, uh, I had a kidney ano, but uh, na naagapan naman so I'm okay na First doctors are always very careful. The yes, other doctors that I don't publicly inform is is the nagopare. I just oh, eh. 
ko September eh. So, oh, yeah. so the, uh, uh, member of the club na pala. So, you know, we can do a lot through information technology eh. Yes. Mabilis nga ang pacing. But were you affected by the floods in Togedaraw? Uh, we, we did a lot and we're still doing a lot of uh, helping out of the private sector. I'm very grateful for all the help from Manila and elsewhere. So far, okay naman na. But of course, yung damage is just we have na lang. Oh. The PDRCI board decided to donate uh, uh, an amount uh, yeah, for the victims of the flood. Uh, kami, our place, hindi, we want 10% na hindi na baha. But siyempre, yung mga agricultural lands namin, lahat talaga totally damaged. Like all the crops were ground. Uh, we have recovered. We are planting a new. Ganun lang naman yan. <laughs> Ito lang medyo malaki ang mabilis at mataas ng pag-flood. So, yes, sir. Maraming mga caught unaware at they had to so, yan na lang yung kanari-ari at talagang nalulog. Just want to mention, sir, si Jean is uh, very helpful. And, uh, you know, really one of the things this. that we are thankful for, uh, we have uh, uh, streamed down our IDP staff. No, no, maabot kami ng 54 people na karamihan messengerial and uh, law staff functions. So we let go of about 15 to 20 of them. We replaced them with only six wow. more competent. Now we're getting the results. They're running. Oh. And on kasi po, <laughs> Senior, puro clerk, puro secretary eh. Walang, walang nagagawa. Kung wala yung mga abogado, eh ngayon we have the program officers. They're the ones delivering these things. And I hope uh, they make sure up to your point na pag may kinakailangang i-attention natin, sabihin nyo lang ako. Apo. Si Attorney Fe Garcia, she's based in Manila. She's our National Executive Director for Ad uh, I think she will be the witness for the MOA signing. Yeah, oh. Third day. Minsan kahit gabi, si Jin, gising pa eh. Mag-communicate pa sa akin. Yung mga kwan sila eh, multi-skilled and kwan uh, and uh, team workers sila. So, uh, that's what, that's why we're doing that now. Because we, we really overhauled our national staff. Mm -hmm. Uh, better competence, uh, better work ethic, at saka output based na tayo. Noon kasi parang security guard eh. Uh, <laughs> Dito our base, pare, yun lang din na. Yun. Overtime pa sila ng overtime eh. Puro clerical and staff work naman. So, pag wala na yung wala lang nangyayari. Eh ngayon kahit wala tayo dyan, the program officers move. And, uh, hindi naman sila nakakahiyang iharap sa mga partners eh. Kasi masisipag naman sila. Uh, by the way, sir, have you met uh, our president, si Tony Tan, before? No, not yet, not personally. Yet. Kasi remember, in a boy, ikaw, si Yola. So, I'd like, to, I'd love to see, uh, to, to meet a Tony Tan. Sabi niya, he will, ano daw, uh, in time for uh, the signing, actually. Ah, okay. Mukhang meron pa siyang meeting niya. Uh, ako rin. I'll okay. Uh, in two minutes, we will start, sir. Uh, you might just want to... Ah, okay. See Thank you.
Jin or Bamba? Are they all in? Our participants? Um, we now have 73 uh, people inside the room. Okay, thank you. At exactly 10 o'clock, let's we'll start. Sir, uh, no. let's start. Tony Kayosa. Good morning, I'm uh, Bing Pavilia of the Philippine Dispute Resolution Center or PDRCI. I'm delighted to be part of this roadshow on the introduction of, to Alternative Dispute Resolution or ADR organized by the Integrated Bar of the Philippines in partnership with PDRCI. To start the program, I'd like to introduce to you someone who is a stunt supporter of ADR. His passionate dedication in promoting ADR as a way of helping the poor and the marginalized access justice without going to the courts to settle their dispute is very inspiring. He was indeed instrumental in pushing forward this roadshow as a way of introducing to the local IVP chapters the various modes of ADR to enable them to assist their clients to solve their disputes without bringing them to courts. My friends who delivered the opening remarks at today's event, this helped me in welcoming the national president and chairman of the 24th Board of Governors of the IPP, Attorney Domingo Egon Q. Cayosa. Sir? Thank you, Bing, and uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar in partnership with uh, the PDRCI. And um, we are very thankful that you're here with us. We understand that more than 300 uh, have uh, registered. We have uh, so many of you already in, in the room. But uh, uh, we are very thankful uh, to our partner, PDRCI. It's, uh, by the way, the most established arbitration group in the country. So, tayo naman sa IBP, uh, being the mandatory, orga mandatory organization, it makes sense and it is uh, very healthy for us to have a partnership with the RCI. Uh, kung ang pinag-uusapan natin ay yung ADR, at, uh, alam naman natin ba na nauna sila dyan at matagal na sila dyan sa uh, arbitration and uh, mediation and all kinds of things. I'd like to congratulate um, the officers of uh, PDRCI, uh, being uh, and, and the others, and also our uh, IBP program officers and our chapters for making this webinar uh, a reality. Uh, we we confirm what Ding has said that noon uh, paman, even before I became uh, IBP president, I have always. Uh, advocated for ADR and this uh, activity is one of those things of uh, one way of moving forward no? uh, as all the lawyers in the chapters would know uh, we, we aim to do more better faster at IBP uh, through transparency accountability and efficiency mechanisms and most importantly through partnerships at dito naman natin nakita na kung ang IBP marunong makipag-partner sa iba in the formal IBP structure, then we can do a lot more and we can benefit from the synergy, from the expertise, resources, talent, and time of our partners. To date, we have more than 20 partnerships with government organizations, institutions, non-governmental organization, corporate uh, uh, organizations, uh, and even foreign bar associations and, uh, and institutions. Marami na yan, and I could tell everyone that it pays to enter into partnerships. And later on, we will sign the MOA between IBP and PDRCI to formalize our collaboration and our long-term relationships. Personally, uh, I am an advocate of ADR. Why is that? Because as a, as a veteran, 
have seen, and we have to admit it, the delayed justice and denied justice in our country is a shared shame and a collective burden of Filipino lawyers and all those who work in the justice sector. Uh, admittedly, uh, the fields of justice you know, move slower in our country. And that is why, under these circumstances, it is imperative for us to seek new ways and means of expediting the resolution of disputes and issues and avoiding tedious court litigation. Kaya naman po, um, nung uh, tayo namumuno, when we were EVP, we supported the creation of a another institution, the Philippine International Conflict Resolution Center para makatulong dito. Dinala ko din po ang ating Board of Governors sa Hong Kong uh, International Arbitration Center uh, para ma-expose sila naman sa larangan ng international arbitration. At uh, nakita rin nila, we realize that um, rather than compete with this well-established centers of international arbitration, baka mas makakatulong tayo sa ating bansa kung gamitin natin ang karunungan ng mga experts sa ADR para mapalaganap ang ADR, arbitration, negotiation, and other forms of ADR sa ating local na level. At ito na nga ho ang resulta niyan. Uh, there is now a healthy cooperation and collaboration between IBP and PDRCI uh, para maibaba sa ating mga provinces the benefits and the practice of ADR. Now, uh, let me just um, give an overview. Uh, one, uh, we all know that uh, ang ating mga kababayan, medyo natatagalan sila sa mga traditional na proseso sa ating mga korte, sa judicial bodies and administrative bodies. Pero hindi naman ho pwedeng mawala yan. So, nasa batas yan. Kaya lang, nasa batas din ho ang arbitration and all kinds of ADR. Hindi nga lang ito sinusulong at hindi lang ito mini-mainstream. Itong ginagawa natin ay simula ng mga uh, pagpatuloy sa ating programa na i-mainstream ang ADR para makinabang naman hindi lang yung mga hundreds of millions ng mga issues o mga kaso, kundi yung mga simpleng kaso sa ating kanayunan sapagkat uh, ito naman yung ating tinutugunan sa IBP sa ating free legal aid. Kaya ako nagpapasalamat sa mga eksperto at mga institusyon, mga personalities ng RCI. Ito ho, magagaling sila sa international arbitration, ang lalaki, bilyon-bilyon yung values of the cases they handle that they were willing to help us and our country bring the benefits and the timeliness of ADR resolutions to our provinces. So maraming salamat sa kanila. Pangalawa, uh, so we would rather have results rather than uh, endless litigation. Ito rin ay swak na swak dun sa ating uh, uh, programa uh, with respect to OFW. Rather than encouraging OFW which will stay there for so long because the OFWs can only come home once a year, we would rather help them do ADR to resolve their legal problems. Para sa ganun, eh, hindi mabinbin sa mga korte. Yan ay napatunayan na natin. Uh, bring better, faster relief to them if we do ADR. That, of course, nananawagan ng ating Supreme Court at ating mga hukom, tumulong naman tayo i-declag yung mga dockets. So yung mga palliatives at mga improvement in the rules, supportado yan ng IBP. Kaya lang, we really have to have a paradigm shift. Kasi alam naman natin, marami ng mga refinements in the rules, pero delayed pa rin ang ating justice. So baka sobrang dami nang pumupunta sa kote. Why is that? Because it is a monopoly of government. Eh meron naman tayong batas sa ADR na kung baga pinaprivatize yung delivery of justice, resolution of cases, and give parties better autonomy. So yun, let's pursue that. Hindi mawawala yung mga court processes at traditional legal processes with government 
but we're opening another avenue by which our litigants can choose, can opt to resolve their disputes outside of the courts with the people, the lawyers, and the, the professionals that they trust to resolve their cases in the way they want it to be resolved and within the time frame agreed by the parties. So, subukan ho natin ngayon. Uh, the other one, of course, is uh, there's, we have a campaign of simplifying the law, demystifying the law, and humanizing the lawyer. So, kung minsan ho yung justicia, yung batas, hindi na intindihan ng ating taong bayan. At yung abogado, kung minsan pinagsususpechahan at yung iba naman, tinitingala. Let's simplify the law. At the end of the day, if we allow the parties to choose how to resolve their cases, malamang marami sa mga yan gusto na nila pwede ba sa labas na lang ng korte basta merong matinong abogado o taong mamamahala dun sa kaso na ito. E, ito nga ko yung ADR. Eh. Kulang lang tayo ng kaalaman at training. Kaya ito, yung gagawin ng PDRCI together with IBP is to conduct trainings with our legal aid clerks, with our legal aid lawyers, and everybody in the chapters who would want to be equipped to be a good and competent ADR practitioner. Okay? Uh, we, we will take away the government monopoly in the delivery of justice, and uh, we will also be training those who would be interested and who become competent ADR practitioners. Kasi ayaw din naman natin na we promote ADR pero wala namang competence dun sa baba. And that's why we're very thankful that you're here with us. Um, please understand also, uh, I'd like to mention it, marami sa mga traditional na gawain ng abogado, alimbawa legal opinion at drafting of contracts, eventually my friends, artificial intelligence will take over those functions. I have seen that in China. I have seen that in Singapore. They're doing it in other advanced countries. And people have access to this artificial intelligence internet. So, meron tayong area of practice, traditional area of practice, na mawawala talaga sa mga abogado. And that is why ADR is one viable additional, if not alternative, practice for lawyers. Because uh, machines, computers, artificial intelligence cannot do ADR. And so please, I hope you look at this ADR as another area of practice. Not only pro bono ADR, but even you know, uh, professional ADR that can be lucrative for you. So as, we, as we appreciate the help of the experts in our field, our brother lawyers, kagaya ng mga speakers na nakahilera, please be mindful of that. Uh, we will use this learning to help the poor resolve their disputes much faster and quicker. And at the same time, we help the courts declug uh, their dockets. Third, we will also develop a new market, a new area of practice for our lawyers. So, ako ay natutuwa din na nandito yung mga chapters sapagkat palagi ko namang sinasabi ang programa ng IBP nakasalalay talaga sa mga chapters. And that is why ang unang bugso nito is really to introduce the chapters, our provincial lawyers, our legal aid clerks to the concept of ADR. So, listen very carefully to the experts in the field uh, they have adjusted the presentations uh, for those who will be handling uh, the not so big cases. Kasi magagamit natin ang kanilang karunungan, ang kanilang experience in resolving big time billion dollar cases, hundred million dollar peso cases. Magagamit din natin yan sa pagtulong sa ating mga mahihirap na may mga suliranin na legal o mga kaso o mga issue sa ating mga areas of operations, sa ating mga probinsya, sa ating mga syudad. At uh, yun ho ang role ng IBP ngayon. We are pushing online ADR as another 
uh, way of helping the poor resolve their issues. I'm also happy to inform you that uh, your IBP president, uh, Akupo, I, uh, uh, we were uh, appointed or designated as a member of the advisory uh, board of the Office of the Alternative Dispute Resolution. So bukas, manunumpa kami, kasama ko si Atty. Pangan, na isang, ma isang uh, magaling na lecturer ni Mamaya o presenter ni Mamaya. Uh, please be assured that we will network what we're doing here at IBP PDRCI with the what government will be doing at the Office of Alternative Dispute Resolution. We're very thankful also to know that no less than Secretary Maynard Guevara hated to OADR that uh, he would want uh, ADR to be his legacy. So let's take advantage of that. We have that uh, healthy relationship with government. Let's create the market for ADR in our country. Let's bring it down to the level of the ordinary Filipino uh, family. The main mga legal issues. Let's also uh, enhance our justice sector workers and adding legal aid staff at ang ating mga abogado para makapagsilbi sila at magamit ang karunungan ito na magbigay lunas sa lalong madaling panahon sa ating mga mahihirap. So, we look forward to a continue. Ito lang ho, umpisa. There will be others uh, that we will be doing uh, next year. Facing, but be assured that IBP will support uh, this uh, partnership fully and we're committed uh, with our resources. We're very happy that we have a lot more resources now. Nagpapasalamat tayo sa Kongreso. Gagamitin natin yan. Hindi natin yan mawawal. Gagamitin natin yan para magkaroon talaga na tunay na kapasidad at uh, karunungan ng ating mga kapatid na abogado dito sa ADR. So maraming salamat sa mga chapters. Please cooperate with us so that we can help you do more, better, faster at IBP. And yung ating kampanya, susuportahan natin yung justice bilis, in the justice tiis. At after we shall have helped the poor in our provinces, I assure you, uh, with your knowledge and with the expertise of our colleagues in PDRCI, you can be further trained as world-class global arbitrators and mediators. So, swak na swak yan dun sa ating kampanya to promote the global Filipino lawyer. Salamat sa PDRCI, uh, salamat sa mga chapters, salamat nandito ngayon, spread the word. This is just the start. There will be more to come. Do this until maservisuhan talaga natin yung maraming naghihintay ng justisya sa ating bansa. Maraming salamat. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you very much, President Carol Cayosa. Uh, it's really very inspiring and uh, your delivery of your opening remarks really came from the heart. Before we proceed with the program, I would just like to remind the participants that since we have a slot dedicated to the open forum in the program, we would like to request that if you have questions, just kindly raise them up in the chat box. To be able to effectively manage our very limited time, we can entertain only a limited number of questions. We hope you understand. The Secretariat will be the ones to select the questions, which I will read for a particular lecturer to respond to. Here now to deliver the first lecture in this roadshow is an ADR practitioner and international development consultant. He is the current Vice President for External Affairs of PDRCI and its former Secretary General who for seven years administered all commercial arbitration proceedings filed before the PDRCI. He holds a Master of Laws degree in Dispute Resolution at University of Missouri, Columbia. 
He was postgraduate uh, fellow in ADR in Hamlin University School of Law and a Bachelor of Law degree from UP. He is admitted to practice law in the Philippines and New York. He is also an accredited mediator and arbitrator of the PDRCI, Construction Industry Arbitration Commission, Office for Alternative Dispute Resolution, the Wholesale Electricity Spot Market, and the Philippine International Center for Conflict Resolution. He is a professorial lecturer, ADR Department of PILJA Corps of Professors, member of the Board of Trustees of the Philippine Institute of Construction and Arbitrators and Mediators, or PICAM. He served as a sole arbitrator, emergency arbitrator, chair or tribunal member in domestic and international arbitration relating to disputes involving various commercial sectors. I'm also proud to say that he has just been recently appointed by the Secretary of Justice as a member of the OADR Advisory Council. Ladies and gentlemen, here to deliver the lecture on negotiation, let us welcome Attorney Salvador S. Panga, Jr. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Bing. Good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, President. Um, I've been in uh, ADR practice for almost uh, 20 years now. Uh, like uh, a lot of you, uh, I had been a, a trial lawyer for many years before I actually I decided to shift my specialization to ADR. I was a partner in a uh, litigation law firm for about 10 years. So like uh, many of you, I, I know how uh, the experience has been uh, going through all uh, the courts, traveling, uh, filing your cases, arguing your motions, and actually waiting for a very, very long time before the cases get decided. And that's probably the main reason why I shifted my practice to, to ADR. Um, I'm part of the PDRCI team that will uh, give you an overview this morning on uh, the various ADR processes that you might want to consider um, as part of the tools of the trade uh, as you engage in uh, your respective practice uh, areas, regardless of uh, the particular field of specialization you may be in. Uh, ADR will always be very useful. Why? Because we are all uh, human beings and because we interact with each other on a daily basis, there will always be the potential for conflict. And of course, if there is a potential for conflict, there will always be the possibility of dispute resolution. So regardless of whatever field uh, colleagues that you may be practicing in, whether it be tax, family law, intellectual property, banking, finance, whatever, I assure you that ADR can be a useful uh, tool uh, to, for you to be able to conduct your practice uh, in a manner that will provide greater value to your respective clients. Now, um, since ako yung naunang speaker, I, I probably have a little time to discuss with you. Bakit natin pinag-uusapan ngayon ang ADR? Why is it an important area uh, to discuss? Um, why should we as practitioners know a little about it? Well, first of all, don't take my word for it. No, It's, it's really the Supreme Court that tells us it's an important area. Uh, of practice that we need to be familiar with. Why? If you note, doon sa ating MCLE every three years, where we are supposed to take 36 units of uh, uh, refresher courses, ADR, uh, the ADR requirement consumes five credits. That's approximately 15% of the entire MCLE caseload, which goes, you know, which just tells us how important uh, this area is to the Supreme Court. Now, why is it an important area? Because in recent years, actually this, this has not been a recent problem. This has always been a problem for the courts. The courts have always been overburdened with a lot of cases. Okay. 
just to give you an idea, there are, you know, sa plantilla ng Supreme Court, there, is supposed, there are supposed to be approximately 2,000 uh, regional trial court judges and approximately uh, 1,800 to 2,000 first level judges. Pero hindi na pupuno yung plantilla na yan. Uh, more or less, there's a 25% vacancy rate uh, in the court system because, ka, uh, because even if maraming applicants to Metro Manila courts and nearby areas, mababa ang applicant rate doon sa far-flung areas, particularly sa ARMN. Ang result nito is that on the average, each second level court, each RTC, has an average case load of anywhere between 700 and 800 active cases. Okay. Of course, depending sa korte yan, some courts have more, some, some courts have less, but more or less, that's the national average. Now, if you're talking of the first level courts, uh, they have on the average anywhere between 400 to 500 active cases in their respective dockets at any given time. So, doon pa lang sa sheer numbers alone, that will tell us kung bakit napakatagal ng delivery of justice in our judicial system. It's not because the courts, the, the judges are not working hard. They are working very, very hard. It's just that napakarami ng mga kaso nakasalang sa kanila. And that is the reason why the Supreme Court uh, has encouraged ADR practice uh, in order to reduce the number of cases that are being brought before the courts and for the cases that are before the courts, they have implemented certain programs like the court annex mediation uh, and the JDR programs that will uh, ideally result in the reduction of our encouraging settlement. Uh, on the average, uh, colleagues, uh, you should know that it takes anywhere uh, between five to seven years for a case to be finished at the trial court level. Okay? On the average, when a case gets filed before the regional trial court, it takes approximately five to seven years. On the average, for a case to be decided from the time it's filed, to the time the trial uh, judge actually decides the case. And as you know, for those of you who are active practitioners, it takes at least two or three more years for the case to be decided on appeal, so court of appeals, and it takes a few more years for the case to be finally decided the Supreme Court. So it just gives you an idea of how lengthy and how convoluted and how uh, co uh, complex the cases uh, are decided at the judicial level. And that's why it's important for us as practitioners to know a little about ADR because this gives us the opportunity to actually have some control over the way the cases get resolved. Why is that? Because under the law, RA 9285, ADR uh, is uh, a process by which the parties can select the manner by which the cases are eventually resolved. In other words, that instead of bringing the cases to court, the parties are now given the opportunity or given the decision to actually take the case to whatever process they think is helpful in order to resolve that case, with a few exceptions in the case of public policy cases. So, so that's basically it. You know? If you practice in ADR, then you have the ability to make a choice. You ask yourself, for certain types of cases, is it ideal to bring this case before the court? Or is it better to submit this case to a different mode of, of dispute resolution where uh, uh, maybe negotiation or mediation or arbitration or any other process that uh, might appear uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, for, for, for that particular case? Now, kami sa PDRC, most of our cases have actually been submitted to arbitration and, uh, and that is actually a very fast process of resolving cases as will be discussed later. Now, in my case, I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing the concept of negotiation uh, with you guys. 
So let me just share my screen with you so I can share uh, um, a few concepts regarding negotiation. Now, um, okay, now let's begin by discussing uh, what I'd like to refer to as the lawyer's standard philosophical map. And, and uh, what do I mean by this? This is basically ano ang ating mindset or orientation whenever we are confronted with a case or whenever a dispute is submitted to us or referred to us by a potential client. Ano ang ating mindset, ano ang ating naiisip whenever a case is referred to us? Okay. Yung ating orientation sa paghawak ng isang kaso is based on the orientation or approach that has been taught to us in law school. It's based on the adversarial model. Ano ibig sabihin nito? You remember in law school, we are taught that the other party should always be considered the adversary or the opponent. Kalaban yan. There is no space. There is no... Uh, uh, there should be no opportunity, there should be no space uh, uh, given to the possibility of collaborating with the other party. Kasi kalaban yan eh. And you should not cooperate with the other party because if you give the other party uh, certain concessions, to the extent that you give those parties the concession, you lose that particular concession for your client. In other words, parati natin iniisip yun as a zero-sum game. Whatever the other party wins, to that extent, you lose that. So if, let's say, you give up a particular right or a particular privilege that the law grants in favor of your client, mawawala yan uh, to your client's detriment. And therefore, yun ang ating orientation not na tinuturo sa atin sa law school. Disputants are always adversaries. What one party wins, the other must necessarily lose. Ano pa? Ano ang second thing na tinuturo sa law school? Ang tinuturo sa law school is that there can only be one standard of justice. There can only be one right or wrong. Okay? The right thing is always to be decided by reference to a rule of law. Okay? Ano ang tama? Tingnan mo yung batas. Okay? And who interprets the law? It's applied by a neutral third party, typically the court or the administrative agency that is uh, uh, given jurisdiction by law to decide that particular dispute. So there can only be one solution to a problem and that is the legal solution. The solution that the law prescribes to be the proper solution and there can only be one person to decide the outcome of a particular case. Okay. So yun ang ating mindset whenever we handle cases. Ano pa? We are taught as part of the principles of uh, legal and judicial ethics sa law school that our duty is to be a zealous advocate for our clients. And our duty to our client requires an exclusively competitive mindset. Okay. And that is why as lawyers, diba, uh, we, we think of ourselves as warriors, we think of ourselves as combatants, we look at trial as if it were war. Diba? No holds barred, don't give an inch to the other party, scorched earth strategy, pag natalo ka sa isang particular motion, MR ka, pag natalo ka, iaakyat mo on certiorari, pag natalo ka, iaakyat mo again to a higher court and so on and so forth. At pag natalo ka dun sa motion na yun, balik kayo sa baba to be litigated again. Okay? Uh, and the matter goes to the court again until the next motion that you lose. And then you go through the same convoluted process and that's why the resolution of the case takes a very, very long time to finish. Okay? This mindset actually results in a very frustrating outcome to our clients. Una, napakatagal. Pangalawa, napakagastos. Okay? It's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources. And because of this, this mindset, we are taught that even during settlement negotiations, lawyers are still expected to be adversarial. Because we are taught that the only way we can create value for our clients is if our client 
gets it all, gets everything. Bahala na problema na nung kabila. Okay, kung mawalan siya, my goal as a lawyer is to get everything and take everything from my client. That is how we were taught. And that, you know, unfortunately, that is the principle that guides most of us as we conduct our respective practice, particularly those of us who are engaged in trial practice. Ang problema is that this model has a lot of limitations. If we think of ourselves as combatants, if we think of ourselves as competitive lawyers, we, there are actually very serious limitations to ourselves uh, as being effective advocates for our clients. Okay. Why is that? Number one, if we adopt this mindset, if we adopt this practice, if we adopt this orientation uh, as lawyers, you will note that settlement talks with another party almost often fail. Okay? Why? Because you do not provide for the opportunity where the other party can also gain in the negotiation. So as a result, the settlement talks often fail. Okay. There are times that the, settle, that, that the negotiation results in a successful settlement. But even if it's successful, it is not durable. Why? Because ang feeling ng kabilang party, na, naisahan siya. Kapag <laughs> nagmuling na siya, at inisip niya kung ano ang napagkasunduan, iisipin niya sa dali na isahan niya ang taakuan. I don't think that's an appropriate settlement to this problem. And to the extent that the other party feels aggrieved, masisira yung agreement, okay, by questioning yung agreement, or he will not uh, participate in the appropriate and enthusiastic implementation of that settlement agreement. Okay. Now, isa pang limitation on is that the opportunity to create win outcomes is often overlooked. And finally, as a result, failed negotiations result in parties that are very frustrated, thus dragging out litigation even more. I am sure uh, for many of you, hindi unusual yung hinawa kami yung kaso ng 10 years no? uh, or more. Nanalo ka man after 10 years, you're excited, pinakita mo dun sa kliyente mo yung decision. hindi naman siya completely masaya. Why? Number one, the client knows pwede pang i-appeal ng kabilang party. Second, the client knows masyado na siyang nasugatan. In other words, the client has expended significant resources in terms of time, cost, and effort. Uh, by the time nanalo siya, either hindi na niya naaalala kung bakit siya galit na galit before, or masyado na siyang gumastos so that even this victory will not actually result in a complete uh, fulfillment for your client. And this results inevitably in the other client appealing, so lalong nagtatagal, and the, the parties end up getting very, very frustrated as the cases drag on. Uh, for a significant uh, period. What I'd like to uh, ask you to consider during this presentation is whether as lawyers, you might want to think of you know, negotiation as a first step before considering more drastic courses of action. Now, I know as lawyers, iniisip nyo, eh parati naman akong nakikipag-areglo with the other party. So, hindi mo na kailangan kaming sabihan what are the basic negotiation principles. That may be true. Uh, I concede that. But it may happen also that because all of us have the mindset, the kind of mindset or orientation that I have referred to earlier, it may happen that in a lot of cases, we are not uh, effectively negotiating a particular dispute in a way that will provide greater value to our clients. So what I'd like to do is to present you with an alternative way of thinking about negotiation such that you may, you may want to consider this, these principles in uh, uh, later on helping craft solutions for your clients as part of 
negotiation in a pending dispute so that you can create greater value for your clients. Now, just as a background, itong negotiation principles na to were actually uh, developed by the Harvard Negotiation Project many years ago. This was uh, based on a book written in the early 80s entitled Getting to Yes by professors Roger Fisher and William Urey. This has become the, the, the Bible of negotiators. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, materials in negotiation are based on uh, this uh, fun uh, fundamental and foundational work. Uh, sinasabi nila doon that when you are considering negotiating with another party in order to resolve a dispute or in order to craft a deal, uh, they're asking you to consider what they call principled negotiation. Kaya principled negotiation kasi nakabase yan daw sa apat na negotiation principles. What are these? No. Sinasabi nila, first of all, it's important to separate the people from the problem. What do they mean? Sinasabi nila, in any negotiations, actually, naglalaro yan sa dalawang dimensions. Do not think of a dispute, let's say, don't think of a land dispute merely as being a problem about land. Don't think of a copyright dispute merely in terms of it being an intellectual property dispute. Don't think of a family dispute in terms of uh, it simply being a dispute regarding the rights and obligations of the parties under the family code. Sinasabi nila dyan, there are at least two dimensions to any dispute. And there are at least two dimensions to any negotiation. One is the substance. Okay, it may be an intellectual property dispute, a land dispute, a family dispute, a construction dispute. Okay, yun yung substance na pinag-usapan. But equally important is that dispute also contains relationship issues. Okay, kapag nagko-combine yung relationship issues with the substantive issues, jaan nagkakaroon ng convoluted negotiation between the parties because oftentimes na overshadow yung substance ng relationship. If you think about it, let's give an example. Let us say, um, merong isang family corporation na malaki, established ng parents. Okay. The corporation, let's say for the past three decades, has grown into a huge conglomerate. Okay. Tumanda na yung parents. Unfortunately, they failed to do appropriate estate planning before they passed on. Okay. And then namatay na sila. Let's say may naiwang tatlong anak. Okay. So ano magiging dispute? Paano paghahatian yung estate? Paano i-divide yung business? Diba? So that you know, the substance of the relation of the dispute actually refers to paano ang hatian ng properties. Paano ay yung hatian ng negosyo. But as we all know, for those of us who have represented uh, clients with difficult family issues, that's just one part of the problem. The other problem is really as important, and that is the relationship among the surviving heirs. Diba? Uh, uh, if you recall, no, uh, if, uh, if you're familiar with this one, ang isang true life example dyan, yung sa uh, nasa newspapers ngayon. No? I don't know anything about that case personally. All I know is what is in the newspapers. Yung away ngayon, for example, ng Ceres Bus Company. It's the biggest privately uh, held uh, transportation group, I think, in the Philippines. They have thousands of buses. Meron silang away na na magpamilya, magkakampi ngayon yung mother, uh, yung, yung isang anak na lalaki at yung isang anak na babae. Ang kalaban nila, about four other children. No? Uh, it has, uh, the, the, the dispute has become so messy that they are now charging each other, magkakapatid to, they're charging each other with uh, various criminal offenses. So you can see, it's not really a dispute just about substance, but it's also about a relationship. Now, separating the people from the problem 
uh, is going to be very difficult because you know typically very intertwined yan uh, yung 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 uh, yung substance sa relationship problems it uh, the, uh, it uh, because it's highly emotional the dispute is highly emotional it often gets intertwined with the substance of the negotiations and as lawyers we need to recognize that dichotomy what are the typical types of people problems that are involved una perception okay dun sa sinasabi nating problema let's say inheritance uh, dispute uh, re involving an ongoing uh, business concern there are a lot of perception issues for example feeling ng isang anak ginugulangan siya ng isang anak ba feeling ng isang anak uh, mas mahal siya ng magulang okay that's their perception and therefore uh, ang feeling niya he should get more he or she should get more because sa tingin ko ako yung intended heir of the company ang intention ng parents ko ako mag, mamalakad ng negosyo moving forward. So that's a particular uh, problem that we need to recognize, perception. Another dimension is emotion. Okay? That's also uh, a people problem. So syempre, dahil meron dyang uh, history at alitan uh, uh, and then it involves significant amounts of money, mataas ang emotion uh, uh, among the disputing parties and also there are communication issues no because of all of those uh, problems emotions nagkakaroon ng difficulty uh, yung isang grupo or yung isang air communicating with another air so those are all the 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 people dimensions the people problems in that particular dispute now sinasabi ngayon anong nagdevelop ng theory na to na, na principled negotiation that you need to separate the people from the problem. You need to recognize that all these things are happening, but at the same time, you don't attack the people, you actually attack the problem. So when uh, some parties become very aggressive, very hostile, uh, uh, highly emotional, the challenge for the negotiator is to approach the problem very coolly uh, and then just accept no, that those kinds of problems are part of the dispute, but the negotiator must be able to separate all those people problems, perception problems, emotion, and communication problem, and go into the substance of the dispute, which is, uh, for example, yung hatian, uh, yung rights and obligations ng heirs, and how to uh, uh, how to operate the business moving forward. So, the first principle na tinuturo nila is to separate the people from the problem. Okay. So, they say it's important to recognize that there are highly emotional issues that are affecting the negotiation. You recognize that they are part of it, but you separate the people from the problem. Kasi if you try to resolve uh, all of those jointly, okay, then usually you get bogged down in the high emotion and then you are unable to move forward with the negotiation. So that's the first principle now, separating the people from the problem. Now, another principle uh, that they would like to you to consider is that in any negotiation, it's important for the parties, for the negotiating parties, to focus on interests and not positions. Okay, what are positions? Typically, if you think about it, in, in a negotiation, the parties start off with making demands. Okay, doon sa theoretical problem na sinasabi natin na merong problema sa inheritance, typically what you will hear is one, one child saying, I want this particular property. Or this is the amount of cash that I will be happy with. I want X number of shares in the corporation. This is what I deserve. Okay. When you say all those things, all those demands are positions. Positions are what the parties demand. Okay. Ito yung gusto ko, ito yung hinihingi ko. I don't care what you want. 
this is what I want, ibigay mo sa akin. Pag, pag hindi mo sa akin binigay, hindi mo makukuha. Uh, hindi ka magkakasundo. Interests, on the other hand, are the needs of, of, of these parties. No? Um, interests are the reasons why they are making those demands. So sinasabi dito, interests are the reasons or the driving force behind these positions. And uh, they're saying that in order for you to move forward in the negotiations, it's important for the negotiators to focus on the interests of the parties, not on the initial demands that they're making. What are the basic interests? They include security, economic well-being, sense of belonging, recognition, and control over one's life. So basically, in order to discover these positions, a negotiator is expected to ask why. Okay, pag sinabi, I want this particular property, the negotiator may want to ask, bakit mo na nga gusto yun? Uh, uh, kung makukuha mo yung property na yun, ano ang gagawin mo with that property? What does that property represent to you? Okay. And by asking those types of questions, you now get into the reasons why the parties uh, are making that demands. And those reasons are the important things that the negotiators need to latch on to because addressing those interests, okay, addressing those reasons will actually lead to a productive resolution of the dispute moving forward. Now, the third principle okay, is to invent options for mutual gain. Anong ibig sabihin nito? Okay. Before making a decision on a particular dispute, it's important for the parties to generate as many options as possible in order for these options, uh, ideally with a view to having these options, address yung mga interests that I identified earlier. It's important for the parties to uh, overcome certain obstacles like premature judgment, searching for a single answer, the assumption of a fixed pie. In other words, pag iniisip ng mga tao, yung kumpanya ganyan lang kalaki. Ang mangyayari nun, is if you say ganito lang kalaki yung kumpanya at walang potential for the company to grow bigger or for the business to, di to, to, to go in various directions, ang mangyayari nito, there's a huge tendency for the heirs to get as large of the pie as possible. Diba? Whereas if you present possibilities for the company, kung paano palalakihin yung kumpanya, then the pie becomes bigger and therefore uh, uh, the heirs don't necessarily have to grab as much of the company as possible because they will realize that there may be uh, a lot uh, uh, for the company to offer uh, moving forward. Another obstacle that they need to address is thinking that solving the problem is their problem and then again, it's important to produce a range of options before making a decision. And those options should ideally address the interest of the both, that both parties have identified. And then finally, the fourth principle is that the parties must always insist on using objective criteria in order to resolve the dispute. Hindi pwedeng sabihin na ito ang gusto ko and therefore ibigay mo. A party must insist that impartial standards be used for results. Let's say if it now becomes a valuation issue, okay, we need to place a valuation of the company, anong standards ang kailangan mong gamitin in order to value the property appropriately? You can use industry standards, you can use independent appraisers or experts, you can use trade practices, you can use any other independently reliable standards or reference. So in other words, using these four key negotiation principles, you are able uh, as a lawyer representing a party in a negotiation to be able to uh, create value for your client by allowing your client uh, to consider a range of possibilities uh, uh, in order to improve uh, uh, its current situation and to work with the other party to create value for both parties. Yung tinatawag natin na win-win solution. So basically, that's it in a nutshell yung apat na negotiation principles. Of course, we don't have time to discuss everything in depth, but you may want to consider 
using these four basic negotiation principles in your practice whenever you consider resolving a dispute with the other party before entering into any other uh, uh, more extreme measures like taking the other party to court. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. So that's it, no? basically uh, that's a short discussion of some basic negotiation principles you may want uh, to consider when you are in a dispute with another party. So, okay, I'll, I'll hand it off again to Bing uh, for the next presentation. So thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much, Attorney Panga. Our next lecturer has been an ADR advocate for over 20 years as an accredited mediator, arbitrator, and lately as adjudicator in the district board. In the field of mediation, he had his formal training in commercial mediation with the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and is an accredited arbitrator and mediator of the same institution. He holds a certificate in mediating complex construction disputes from Pepperdine University School of Law, Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution in the U.S. He is also an accredited mediator of SIA, EDRCI, IPO Field, WIPO, WESM, and Philippine Mediation Center for Court Annex Cases. He is Professor Tu and member of the ADR Committee of the Supreme Court, Ilja. Although not a lawyer, he is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and Society of Construction Law, both in the United Kingdom. He is a civil engineer and an ASEAN Chartered Professional Engineer, a chairman, the chairman of SP, Cast, uh, of, uh, SP Castro, based in the Philippines and Brunei Darussalam, a project management firm specializing in international construction, contracts, and dispute avoidance. Dear participants, to deliver the lecture on mediation, please help me welcome Engineer Salvador P. Castro, or SP, what we call him for short. SP, please. Good uh, morning. Magadang umaga sa inyo. Isang uh, metro mo. Uh, good morning, uh, Atone Cayosa. Si Atone Cayosa, matagal ko lang kakilala dahil magkakasama kami as lecturers sa uh, Court Annex Mediation. And um, as a matter of fact, nung sinabi na merong uh, session about mediation, nung sinabi ko sa PDSA, hindi kilala ako na magaling. Atone Cayosa. And uh, he's very good. He's a lawyer. And usually nangyayari siya na uuna tapos akong kasunod. Because meron kami kanya-kanyang script. And my script is really to discuss about stages of mediation and the art of mediation. Uh, maraming salamat na una si Atone Panga kasi he was talking about negotiation and uh, as you know, mediation is, uh, is uh, a negotiated negotiation. So, lumalabas, it's, there's a third party involved, and usually, yung um, tao, the third party, they call them as a mediator. Now, nung ako yung assigned to give a session of uh, on mediation, and I'm only given a 20 minutes uh, time, sabi ko, mahirap na madali ito. And considering that most, if not all, of the participants are lawyers, and you have taken your MCLE and ADR in the ADR is one of the subjects and mediation is included in that subject. Therefore, today, hindi ako magsasalita about ADR law, hindi ako magsasalita about special rules, hindi ako magsasalita about department circulars and mediation, including mediation rules. But rather, I would share with you a few practical experiences and in the art of mediation. There is a question raised to me uh, whenever I give uh, a sharing. I don't call it lecture, but sharing. Uh, bucket art of mediation. Why not 
the skills obligation? My answer is very simple. Skills can be learned by reading the textbook. Art is by practice. Why? And I was comparing mediation for a mediator as an artist. Leonardo da Vinci painted uh, Mona Lisa. There are so many Mona Lisa that have been painted, but he cannot paint exactly the same Mona Lisa that he painted in the first time. Because it's an art. So an art cannot be repeated. And if you focus it on mediation, mediation is an art. Even if you have mediated one million cases, the one million case will not be the same as the other mediation cases. Simply because you're not an engineer, you're not a lawyer, there's no jurisprudence, it's all art. And art is really something that has to be developed by a person who wants to go to mediation and experience, learn the, the art of mediation. So that's where I started because I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer. And usually the first question that is being asked is why mediate? Palagi tinatanong, bakit tayo magmimediate? So, from my experience, and also from uh, discussion with certain parties, may nakikita ka na merong exclusive feature or exclusive benefits of mediation. Na wala sa arbitration, wala sa, uh, sa uh, litigation, wala sa ibang mode of dispute resolution. Pero lately, from my experience, kasi mukhang nag-graduate ako, I started with mediation, arbitration, and lately, I went into adjudication. And in 2017, we call ourselves a dispute avoidance adjudication board. So meaning to say, the 2017 onward is dispute avoidance. And you use mediation, you use the art of mediation. And I have identified top three. What are those top three? that I use as a selling point with a, with a question mark. First, confidentiality. Information disclosed during mediation will not be revealed to anyone. And this is so stated, stipulated in the mediation agreement of the parties and the mediator's agreement with the parties, wherein we as a mediator warrant that this information will not be revealed to anyone outside of the parties, even if the, mediate, even if the mediation is pre-terminated. So that's our oath. Secondly, relationship. It is only through mediation that you will be able to restore and foster relationship because there will be no win-loss. It will be win-win or whatever is to the satisfaction of both parties. And the third is control. It's only in mediation within the parties have control over the outcome of a dispute. In litigation, it is the judge that controls the outcome of the case. In arbitration, it is the arbitrator that renders an award. In mediation, if the parties are the one controlling the outcome, although the mediator controls the process. And I'd like to give you some typical example on this. And uh, the first one is only very recent because of this COVID, you know, my, uh, as you get a bit younger, you become like consultants in the industry. And I was invited by the Philippine Constructions Arbitration uh, Contractors Association to give a lecture on how they can claim because of this COVID. You know, there have been no work, uh, a lot of problems were encountered in the last couple of months, and the contractors are losing money because they spent so much money preparing for this COVID thing. So one by one, two by two, they started approaching me, and this time I was able to talk to a few small contractors, and they asked me, this is my case. I said, Pwede yan. You can go to arbitration if you want. Sir, wag, sir, wag, wag tayo mag-arbitration. 
Bakit? Delikado yan, sir. Pag nag-arbitration ako, sir, baka mawala na ako ng trabaho sa kliyente ko. So, anong gusto mo? Sir, pwede ba usapan na lang? O di sabi ko, di, mag-negotiate kayo. Pero pwede ba, sir, hingi kami ng tulong? Gumawa ka naman ng counting position para merong one. So, I know, I talk to the client, I talk to the parties. And they were able to solve their, their, their issues with, an, we call it, the unofficial mediation. It's a little bit of negotiation but closer to mediation. And this is, they don't want because they want to keep relationships. And relationship is a very important factor to those that are doing business in the industry. Not only business but also personal. Lalo na sa probinsya, magkakamag-anak, relation is very important. And you don't want to make, make Christmas party kayo, hindi kayo magkakasama. So that is one of the, how do you call that the selling point that you can sell if you want to go to mediation. Then the other one is in the area of confidentiality. I start with the high end and the medium end. You will notice that when there is an invention or a special technology, they go to the lawyers, and, in, and when you mentioned about litigation, you said, no, 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 no. You mentioned about uh, arbitration. They said, well, uh, our problem is yung secret namin malalaman. Yung formula namin malalaman. Saan pumupunta? Intellectual property. I am a mediator of IPO Philippines. And from my what I know, most of the cases referred to uh, IPO Phil were mediated or were settled. I don't think there's any, uh, there's any case that went to arbitration. Simply because you don't want to show to the public your formula. I'm praying not, but maybe baka dumating yung Pfizer that it may go to uh, mediation. It will not go to arbitration. Except on some issues that can really be arbitrate, uh, arbitrated without really going to uh, mediation. The other one is um, control, and uh, I will share with you one experience I have. Uh, this one is not a small case, it is a big, capital letter, big case. I was invited by a lawyer friend of mine to a meeting with the combating parties in order for me to explain to these parties the advantages and disadvantages of institutional arbitration or ad hoc arbitration. So I asked the parties and I said, um, what are the things that you don't want to happen? And they said, uh, pwede, confidential lang, because we don't want the public to know that we are at war. So I checked, why, sir? Kasi yung may ari na kumpanyang A at kumpanyang B, our first cousin, and they are the captains of their own industry. So I said, okay, confidentiality. Ano pa, sir? Uh, pwede ba itong mga arbitrators natin eh, mag-recommend lang? Because we want to decide among ourselves how we will settle our problem. So sabi ko, sir, mukha atang mahirapan tayo dyan. Baka gusto mong subukan itong mode na ito, negotiation. Eh, di na kami nag-uusap na talawa. Mag-negotiate pa kami. Uh, gusto mo, sir, subukan natin ng another mode. Ano yun? Meron ba kayong subukan natin itong mediation? So, I explained to him. Ang said, pinaka-importante dyan, sir, ganito. Kailangan yung tao, may respeto ka at may tiwala ka sa kanya. Kasi yung tao na yan ay gag-guide sa inyo na masettle yung in-dispute. Confidential yan. Kasi hindi lalabas yan. Hindi malalaman ng, ng publiko ang inyong away. Pangalawa, ang mediator ay hindi magbibigay ni decision kundi magsasabi lang ng suggestion. So finally, I believe they decided to go and from, from what I know, mukhang nasettled yung kanilang problema. So these are a typical example that a test has to be given in order for you to know whether you have a good points in mediation. Confidentiality, relationships, and control. Yun lang sa pagkaalam ko, baka marami pa. 
merong fourth na issue rin, which is something to do with uh, communication. Communications, although sinasabi natin that you should communicate, there will be communication among the parties, so we keep on talking about communication. Pero pag nag-away sila, ang nagko-communicate ay abogado. Nagko-communicate ka sila, pero abogado. Nagko-communicate man sila, pero yung mga official nila, pero silang dalawa hindi nagko-communicate. And I heard of one case na pinail sa IPOP, dalawang restaurant owners ni Away. And they have not been communicating for the last 10 years. It was only during mediation that the mediator finally, after four or five sessions, convinced the parties to meet. And that was the only time that they do meet. And I don't know what happened, but I'm pretty sure that since they meet, things have already started to have a link, which is a communication between the parties. So in mediation, communication is very important. Uh, there is communication, litigation, pero ang away kayo sa communication. There is communication arbitration because I'm an arbitrator. And normally, uh, you can hear harsh words that you have to control the parties with the words they use. The other thing is you save time, you save cost, there's flexibility, there's voluntary. But in my case, as a mediator, and as a consultant, I tried to give a question mark that would point what would be the best formula. So that's the example that I have. So the question that is always asked is, what is mediation? What is mediation? I have, I would call it a hybrid definition of mediation. Well, I interconnect it because that is what I use whenever I go into mediation. And these are what I explain to the parties. So what I said, there are five points that I have. What I said is that mediation is a voluntary, non-binding process wherein the parties meet with a mutually selected, impartial, neutral, known as mediator, who will facilitate communication and negotiation and assist the parties in reaching a voluntary settlement regarding the differences. I did not feel dispute. Differences through an agreement that defines their future behavior. And I said, as a mediator, I would call it success if the parties have signed in the settlement agreement. If they don't sign, my mediation process did not succeed. Because that's the only I would see for myself that they did sign. I have done a lot of uh, ad hoc mediation, uh, institutional mediation, especially in the construction industry and you know. Uh, I make sure that they sign a uh, settlement agreement or compromise agreement. Now, let me explain one by one the meaning of this and how it will help. Court annex mediation is mandatory because they have to go to the mediator, but it is voluntary if they want their case to be mediated. I have a case in court annex within there would appear and say, well, Mr. Mediator, I am a Tayo, labas. So it is basically voluntary because it's important that they will volunteer. But if you explain to them, they will volunteer. Either they will try it, but it's voluntary. Secondly, mutually selected, impartial, and neutral person. Yung mediator kailangan mapagkatiwalaan at marespeto ng parties. Maybe hindi niya ka pa napagkatiwalaan ng umpisa. Maybe hindi siya masyado respetado sa'yo. But nung yung pero nung makita in kao at saka nakaroon kayo ng pre-mediation session, then you have, it is the responsibility of the person to make sure that he can be respected and he can be trusted by his action, by his looks, and how he presents himself. The mediator, on the other hand, has no authority to decide. Wala kang authority to decide. Wala kang authority to recommend solutions. And usually, you include that when you make your opening statement. Now, this is where the lecture of uh, um, Secretary Panga would help. Uh, Mabuti lang hindi ko ginamit yung paradigm shift, but that is what Atone Kayoko said. You know, during communications and negotiations, it's really a paradigm shift because you're shifting the party as a shuttle diplomacy from right to interest, from position to interest, attacking and to us problem solving, difference to a common interest, and past to the future. It looks very easy, but it takes time, it takes the art, it takes practices in actual mediation. Role play is good, but role play 
will not really tell you the emotions of a party that is affected. The other one is in the area of assist the parties in reaching a voluntary settlement. The mediator do not make decisions. Walang opinion niya, even if he is asked to give an opinion, he cannot give an opinion on the merits of the position of the parties. And the mediator will not record, although he will keep note, but he will not, uh, no transcript of the mediation process. In short, it is purely confidential. And if the mediator have a notes, all of that, he will show to the party that and he will say, sir, wala talaga, because you have to maintain that kind of trust from the parties. Now I talk about future behavior. The settlement agreement will focus on the future resolutions. It is not the admission of all the sins that you have in the world, and then you come up with a solution. You have to look at the future resolution. And that's why that's how, that's how I will look at it through the definition that defines your role as a mediator, as a mediator, and also in your explanation to the parties about this definition. And that is what I usually use in most of the time. So the question that is raised it. But how do you summarize? You have only two minutes to go. My summary is this. Mediation is a win-win mode of dispute resolution as long as the parties are sincere in resolving their differences the amicable way with a neutral third party or third person that they trust and respect. Since the mediator plays a key role in the mediation process, aside from being trusted and respected, it is suggested that he or she shall undergo informal, formal training on the art and the skills in negotiation and mediation. And lastly, shall be able to lead the parties throughout the different stages of mediation as a guide. And I have one slide which I always use when I do mediate or when I lecture in the court annex, my own roadmap which I prepared. And this is one that would divert the parties from looking at each other if they don't like to look at each other. So I refocus them on this slide and I show them where they are. And that means from the red, we start with agreement, mediators opening statement, parties uh, opening statement, then third, joint discussion, identification of issues, fourth, joint negotiation and closure, writing the settlement agreement and signing the settlement agreement and the blue one is success. And I do that the whole process of mediation so that I will show to them where they are. And unfortunately, I have to tell them somewhere along this road that we have, we will encounter an impasse and eventually <coughs> we'll have a caucus which is an ex party. You don't see that in litigation, no ex party. You don't see that in arbitration but that is a feature in mediation. So you are actually selling. If you talk about mediation, it is a selling to the parties because they could not understand mediation unless you sell to them what is mediation. And a mediator should be able to understand what to sell and how to sell and what are the key features to sell. So if you're going to offer mediation for free or whatever, it's basically the same. Because you're talking about two human beings with an emotion, with an understanding that I don't think they really want to go to war. It was just a situation at the event wherein they went to war and it is for us mediator to operate with this win-win solution, win-win fortune. So with that, I have, I, I exceeded by one minute and I would like to thank you very much. And um, I wish you a COVID free, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Castro. Our TED lecturer is a trained arbitrator of PDRCI and an active member of its Rules Revision Committee. She is a member of the Philippine Bar and the New York State Bar. She received her undergraduate degree, magna cum laude at UP, and the Juris Doctor degree also from the same university. She also has a Master of Laws degree from Columbia Law School in New York. 
ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you the youngest member of our team of lecturers, who incidentally is celebrating her birthday today to lecture on arbitration, Attorney Maria Luisa Dominique D. Mauricio. Thank you, Sir Bing. Um, lagi po akong parang nangihina pag si Sir Bing yung nag introduce sa akin. <laughs> but uh, good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I see that we are about 100 participants in Zoom and another 100 in the IBP Facebook account. Thank you so much po for being with us today. So as Sir Bing said, I'm Luisa Mauricio po and I would be discussing with you arbitration. Let me just share my screen with you so you can see there. So I want to start uh, my, my 20 minutes with connecting what you have already discussed um, in, in, the previous, in the previous lectures with what I am about to discuss today. So I, I, I kind of figured out that the only way that I could do this that would be very easy and would be very relatable is to come up with what I call the spectrum of dispute resolution mechanisms. I felt that I would, it would be better for you to understand the topics um, when I show you their position in relation to each other. So in my spectrum of dispute resolution mechanisms, the left side most being the kind of dispute resolution that does not involve any external intervention. And it goes on to the right, and the right most being the kind that involves the most institutionalized external intervention there is. So let me, let me just give you a brief um, review. In the leftmost side is negotiation. So as Sir Panga already told you, it's a strategic discussion between the two parties without any external intervention of a third party to help them come up with a solution to their dispute. Next step to the right is mediation, where Sir Castro already um, discussed to you that it is actually a voluntary process, except that there is a mediator selected by the parties that facilitates the communication and actually assists the parties into reaching a voluntary agreement. Now, to the right of your mediation is arbitration. And this gives you an idea of what arbitration actually is just by looking at the spectrum. It is a step to the right from mediation and it's a step back from court litigation. And I kind of want to highlight this. And why is that? Um, both of my parents are litigation lawyers, but they're actually watching right now. I am so sorry to use you as, as an example. But whenever we discuss arbitration, po, my mom and my dad would always confuse arbitration with some other characteristic of another dispute resolution mechanism. Sometimes they would discuss it like sort of mediation, sort of negotiation, ganon. So th th this sort of... This sort of gives you the, the general idea that Philippine lawyers do not appear to have the same backhand know-how of arbitration as opposed to, say, litigation principles or corporation law principles. And I tried to come up with reasons why this is the case. And these, uh, these, these things that I've put in your screens are those reasons. I felt that arbitration has not yet actually reached its peak in the Philippines. And why is that so? First and foremost, Filipino culture kasi, yung default is to actually skip all the other red remedies and go straight to court. Um, lagi tayo always, um, nadali natin sa court, lagi yung problema natin. And, and, and it's, just, it's just cultural, I think. It's just what we grew up with. So that's still our default. And as Sir Panga has uh, discussed a while ago, this can be seen through the court dockets. They are very much clogged. And he has already given you the statistics of how many cases are actually in the courts. But just to show you a micro concept of it, if you're a litigation lawyer like me and you frequently go to hearings, you would see that the hearing calendars of one branch would be sort would be like 70 cases for just the morning. And, and that would really show you that marami talagang kasong nasa court there right now. Another thing, law firms, even the bigger ones here in the Philippines, do not yet have a separate arbitration department. It's still litigation and arbitration. Also, 
lawyers would rarely identify themselves as practicing solely arbitration. It's always litigation and arbitration or litigation and dispute resolution. This shows you that arbitration as a practice here in the Philippines is not yet stand alone. Also, I, um, I actually asked a few of law students and not all law schools, even the big law schools, the bigger law schools in the Philippines have arbitration electives. At most, some would have a two-unit alternative dispute resolution elective and would have an airtime for arbitration of about like two sessions. So aside from this default court litigation culture that we have, the legal framework in the Philippines is not altogether encouraging as of the moment. Philippine arbitration laws are actually relatively new. I say relatively new because as you can see on the first bullet down there, RA 876, the first ever law on arbitration, was enacted in 1953. Now, 1953 looks relatively old, but if you compare it with the arbitration laws of other jurisdictions, you would see that it's quite young. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, the, the U.S. Federal Arbitration Act was enacted 1926. So that's a, that's a good number of decades ahead of us. And, and to add to that, Though we already had RA-876 in 1953, it wasn't really until RA-9285 that arbitration was actually institutionalized. Despite having these laws, our arbitration laws have also yet to, confer, to conform to international innovations. The international com arbitration community have been busy with innovating arbitration laws and usually, their home state legislatures are quick to enact laws, helping them streamline this innovation. Just to show you a, a concrete example that we have yet to sort of be at par or conform to international innovations, our A9285 adopted 1885 on the law for international commercial uh, international commercial arbitration. This is a framework um, that UNCITRAL came up with for states to pattern their laws so that there would be uniformity in the laws of majority of the states. But some key revisions were actually made in 2006 and admittedly it would be more convenient for us to adopt this revision. Well despite all these, I honestly believe that us Philippine lawyers should give arbitration a chance. And why is that? First of all, the international community actually vouches for it. In a 2018 survey, 97% of respondents indicated that international arbitration is their preferred mode of dispute resolution. You would see that our international counterparts actually widely and extensively use arbitration to resolve their disputes because it is more efficient and more effective than court litigation. Secondly, Philippine jurisprudence has always been pro-arbitration. In a recent case, our Supreme Court has respected and upheld the finality and autonomy of an arbitral award. This means that the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, could not review errors of fact or of law in an arbitral award as a general rule. And this shows you the respect and the encouragement accorded by the Supreme Court to arbitration. Third, there are actually movements towards promoting arbitration in the Philippines as of the moment. In, 1920, sorry, in 2019, the Corporation Code was revised to expressly state that the Articles of Incorporation or the Bylaws of a Corporation may contain an arbitration clause. This means that intercorporate disputes are now expressly arbitrable under Philippine law. Second, there have been recent movements to amend RA-9285, headed by, of course, um, the Office of the Alternative Dispute Resolution, together with the IDP. And lastly, arbitration trainings in the Philippines have actually proliferated throughout the years. The PDRCI has been training um, 
training a bunch of lawyers uh, for a few years now and a few other arbitral institutions including the PICCR have also launched their own trainings in efforts to try and educate more Philippine lawyers on what arbitration really is. And lastly, as I would be arguing in the next few slides, arbitration actually would speed up resolution of not just the disputes that you bring to arbitration, but of all the disputes that are being brought forth now in the court. Now, I hope those two slides have actually made you curious, at least, uh, about what arbitration is by and why are we trying to push it at, the, at this particular moment. So I kind of want to give you like a brief overview of what arbitration is. I took the defi this definition of arbitration from RA9285, the current law on it. And I just, ju just to start off at the onset, I just want to point out that discussions about arbitration and trainings about this is usually about commercial arbitration. But as uh, President Cayosa has very much advocated during his speech, these principles can likewise be used for pro bono services and for meeting the objectives of the IDP of reaching out to all areas in the Philippines. So what is arbitration? Arbitration is a voluntary dispute resolution process in which one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with the agreement of the parties or rules promulgated pursuant to this act resolve a dispute by rendering an award. Now, what I did was I tried to cut up this definition and I would be discussing briefly um, in depth those, um, those, pa those little phrases so that you'd be able to get a bigger picture of what arbitration is. So first, arbitration is voluntary, meaning it's a consensual process that requires the agreement of the parties. Therefore, a party cannot be required to submit to arbitration any dispute that he has not agreed to submit to. That's basically it. Very simple. Arbitration is voluntary. Second, arbitration is a dispute resolution process. And this distinguishes arbitration from other forms of alternative dispute resolution. The use of impartial adjudicative procedures, which would afford each party the opportunity to present its Case. So take note, it's an impartial adjudicative procedure. Next, arbitrations are conducted by one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with the agreement of the parties or by the rules that they have chosen. This just means that if you go to arbitration, you submit your dispute to a non-governmental decision maker selected by or for the parties. This also means that arbitration operates extrajudicially. It's sort of a private dispute resolution mechanism with minimal interference from the court. Next phrase is that arbitration resolves a dispute by rendering an award. Arbitration results in a final and binding decision by a third party decision maker that decides the party's dispute. Sub uh, so, we would be discussing that more later on. So that's your brief overview of what arbitration is. Now I've come up with, I tried to mix up a list um, of other characteristics of arbitration so that you might be able to understand the process more in relation to other dispute resolution mechanisms and also of court litigation. So I, I wanna start with the first characteristic that I have for you, which is party autonomy. Party autonomy just means the parties have the freedom to choose, one, who will arbitrate their dispute, and two, how their disputes will be arbitrated. Who will arbitrate their disputes, meaning choice of arbitrators, and how their disputes will be arbit arbitrated, meaning procedural flexibility. So for the choice of arbitrators, it's just saying that the parties will be able to choose who will arbitrate their dispute. And usually, this is crucial because parties tend to choose someone who specializes in the field of the issue of the dispute. Courts of general jurisdiction, though as competent as these specialized people, would not have the same appreciation of the case. And this is 
simply because these people actually these specialized people actually practice the field 24/7 as opposed to judges that have um that that is uh, a professional judge um, in court dealing with different issues. And, and usually, if you were a party uh, to the arbitration, you might want to have a practitioner in your particular field to decide on your case. Second is procedural flexibility. It just says that parties are free to choose what kind of procedure would govern their arbitration proceedings. The intent actually is to dispense with the technical formalities of court proceedings and instead tailor fit a procedure to their particular dispute. And this is important because there might be disputes that would call for some specialized procedures or for the sake of efficiency and of timeliness, you might want to forgo with some formalities of the rules of court. Take note, however, that arbitration is evidentiary meaning there is no such thing as judicial notice. Everything would have to be proven to the arbitrator. Next is that arbitration or arbitrators have limited jurisdiction. So I put quotation marks there because it's not really limited jurisdiction in the strictest sense that we know of it, but it's it just means that arbitrators do not have com contempt power like that of the courts, and they don't also bind the third parties. The only people that they bind are the parties that actually expressly agreed that they would be bound by the arbitration. Next is cost versus speed. I, 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 I juxtaposed cost with speed because admittedly, um, arbitration would be more costly, more expensive than court litigation. But I would want to try and compare it with the timeliness or, or the timeliness that you would be uh, receiving your award. Arbitration is fairly faster than court litigation for the simple reason that arbitrators do not, do not have the same caseload or the same number of cases in front of them as court. So, and, and just to take note also, when you say speed, I don't mean like 24 hours or two to three days. It's more of, be, more of being relatively faster, not necessarily speedier um, in, in lengths than court litigation. Next is confidentiality. In the Philippines, as a general rule, arbitration proceedings are confidential. And this is in opposition to the general rule that hearings, court hearings, and court dockets are open to the public or to the press for certain reasons. Next is the finality of decision. Arbitration produce, produces a binding award that decides the party's dispute in a final manner, subject only to some limited grounds for challenge. I would like to emphasize that it is not advisory the part that parties may accept or reject. It is not a legal opinion. And as I already told you a while ago, a recent case held that errors of fact and errors of law in an arbitral award could not be reviewed even by the Supreme Court. So that shows you the finality of the decision of an arbitral award. Next is enforceability of your decision. So since the process and the entire procedure is consensual, enforcement is ideally faster. But also enforcement um, is crucial. And aside from it being faster, your judgment, your award, sorry, could be coercively enforced against the unsuccessful party or its assets to a certain extent. Take note, however, that because of this new unique characteristics of arbitration, arbitration proceedings are parties and case specific. There's no principle of res judicata. So those are the characteristics of arbitration that I want to uh, discuss with you. Next, I think it would be convenient for you to know the two types of um, arbitration that you can actually embark on or and actually choose if you do have a dispute that may be resolved through arbitration. 
So that is institutional and ad hoc. Institutional arbitration is just an arbitration administered by specialized arbitral institutions. Arbitral institutions are specialized bodies that provide institutional services for users. They have a set of procedural rules that apply in cases where the parties agree to arbitrate pursuant to such rules. The rules set up the basic procedural framework for your arbitral proceedings. In th there are lots of international institutions like the ICC, the LCIA, the HKIAC, uh, but we also have our own here in the Philippines. We have PDRCI and PICCR. The next classification is ad hoc arbitration. In ad hoc arbitration, parties agree to arbitrate without being under the auspices or supervision of an arbitral institution. The parties select their own arbitrators and they choose pre-existing procedural rules. For international com co commercial arbitration, it's usually the central. So there you have it. Now, I, I want to end my uh, short introduction to you of arbitration with my slide on why bother giving arbitration a chance. And you can, you can review it again. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't be repeating all the uh, reasons that I have already given a while ago, but I kind of want to highlight the last reason that I gave you. I honestly believe that arbitration is the solution to speeding up resolution of disputes. If your dispute is arbitrable, if it can be brought to arbitration, then by all means, please bring it to arbitration. In that way, the cases that would be brought to court would be minimized and the judges would be able to focus on those more complicated cases like um, criminal cases or cases with constitutional issues. And in that way, we get to sort of balance our court dockets and be more efficient in our ju judicial system. So I hope that was a, that was a good um, brief overview of arbitration for everyone. Sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney Mauricio. And again, happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Our last speaker, uh, but obviously not the least, is a senior associate in Kasumbing Torres. He is an attorney in the Philippines and a qualified solicitor in England and Wales. He is an accredited arbitrator of PDRCI and an active member of the PDRCI Arbitration Rules Revision Committee. Before, join, before joining Kisumbing Torres in 2018, he worked in Hong Kong as a counsel at the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. With over a decade of legal experience, he has acted as an arbitrator, an arbitrator partner representative, and a tribunal secretary. He is an accredited arbitrator of PICCR and the OADR and an accredited tribunal secretary of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. He authored chapters in various publications, including the Asia Mediation Handbook, published by Sweet and Maxwell in 2015, and Foreign Investment and Investment Arbitration in Asia, published by Intelsentia in 2019. He earned his Master of Law's degree in International Business Law with merit in 2019 at the London School of Economics and Political Science. His Juris Doctor degree, second honors at the Ateneo de Manila University and his undergraduate degree in Public Health in UP. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Attorney J. Patrick Santiago who will lecture on careers in ADR. Tony Santiago, please. Thank you very much, Bing. Thank you for that um, short introduction. And of course, I'd like to thank everyone for staying. The 91 participants in, in our Zoom, and I'm sure there are more participants who are participating via Facebook Live. So we've all heard about the Know, the, the various forms of ADR, at least the major forms of ADR in the Philippines. And, and now this is more of a synthesis as to you know, what do we do now? What do we do after knowing about these forms of ADR? What is in it for me? Um, I think the first thing that I would like to clarify uh, was something that 
um, Louis has alluded to earlier is that is, is in relation to our law on ADR. The ADR Act of 2004 is the basic ADR law that you have to read. Um, absolutely. If you want to have a career in, in ADR, um, the minimum that you need to do is read the, is, is to read RA 9285, it's IRR, and the special ADR rules. That's the special rules of court on alternative dispute resolution that was issued by the Supreme Court. Um, however, just a comment about what was earlier mentioned, our law is actually a very good law. Our law on ADR, specifically on arbitration, and even to a certain extent mediation, are world class. These are based on international standards. Although not the latest, but there are not a lot of countries that have adopted these latest versions, say, for instance, the Uncitral Model Law on international arbitration. But we do have, the, we do have um, internationally based laws on ADR. And, and that is good for us because our understanding of ADR, specifically arbitration, is also the same understanding of practitioners abroad on arbitration. If we get into an arbitration where the seat of arbitration or the place of arbitration is in Hong Kong or in Singapore, we will not be unfamiliar with Hong Kong arbitration law or Singapore arbitration law because their laws are also based on the ancestral model law, the same basis of our own ADR law, RA9285. And so I really invite you as a minimum, if you are really interested to learn more about ADR and have a career on ADR to really study our law. It is worth your time and it's good for, for the practice. It is good for your clients as well. Now, let me just share my slides on, so we can start our discussion on careers in ADR. Bing, can you see my slide? Yes. All right, great, thank you. But uh, can you have a full, uh, View. Yep, that's it. Thank Kita you. Na? Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Ping. All right. Um, one give me a second. All right. So let's begin with what are your what are the possible careers that are related to ADR? Um, you know, many of us have graduated from law school without even learning about ADR, without having hearing of it, unless some of you have joined the Vismut competition. It is a mock arbitration competition um, for arbitration. Other than that, um, I, I doubt if many of us have, um, have had professors that were in the practice of ADR. Um, I would say personally for myself, I've heard of them, but never really met any of them when I was still uh, a law student. Um, it was only in practice when I learned about ADR and more so after I worked in an arbitral institution where I've actually been exposed to the various careers that are um, associated or related to ADR. So these are some of the careers um, and types of work that you can associate with ADR. First is being a neutral. A neutral is a generic term for a third party that is assisting the parties in an ADR. This can refer to an arbitrator. This can also refer to a mediator or um, a third party expert evaluator. That is a neutral. Um, you can work, um, obviously, um, as an arbitrator or as a mediator. You can also work for an ADR institution, just like what what I did, um, so although I've also been an arbitrator, I worked in an arbitral institution as a counsel, where a counsel will is sort of like an in-house counsel of the ADR institution, where you supervise the, the arbitration, make certain decisions in respect of the arbitration, um, that under the rules, the institution is supposed to make decisions. You can also act as an ADR counsel. You can assist parties. Um, you can be a party representative in an arbitration. You can be a party representative in a mediation as well. Many say that you know, during mediation, lawyers should not be participating. Um, however, I would say that there is still a role for lawyers in, in mediation. And specifically, this is on the part where parties start to um, draft their settlement agreement. I think it is important to have everything. I think it is important for parties to seek um, legal advice 
when preparing their settlement agreement, not necessarily on the substance of the settlement agreement, but more of the form to ensure that you end up with an enforceable settlement agreement. And you can also think about the various modes of dispute resolution in case there is a, a violation of the settlement agreement. Another part is, another role is being a tribunal secretary. A uh, tribunal secretary is one that assists the arbitral tribunal in, um, in an arbitration. You would sometimes have you know, one um, young lawyer, or not necessarily young, but um, someone who will assist the arbitrator. So the, this tribunal secretary can prepare a summary of the facts. This uh, tribunal secretary can prepare the first draft of procedural orders. And the main reason why people would want a tribunal secretary is cost. Um, so rather than um, requiring your arbitrator, who's perhaps early rate are you know, quite expensive, you would much rather have a, a, a junior um, practitioner who will prepare the first drafts um, rather than the more senior practitioner. Another one is an arbitrator assistant. This is more of a, similar to a tribunal secretary, but you are assisting um, a specific arbitrator. Or you can be a professor. So after you learn more about ADR, you might want to teach in, in a law school and promote ADR to law students. You can be a law expert as well. In an arbitration, um, the means law, um, as we know it, needs to be proved as a matter of evidence. In, in an arbitration. There is no judicial notice there. Uh, the general rule is that you have to prove the law, unless, of course, the parties agree that evidence on the basis of law are not any more necessary. Um, a law expert is usually used if you have an international arbitration where the party representatives or even the arbitrators may not be very familiar with the uh, governing law of the contract, and in which case, parties will have to submit the evidence of the law for the appreciation of the arbitrators. Um, also in international arbitration, you might need a translator, transcriber, and um, there's also an industry in ADR called a third party funder. It's, uh, it's not a recent development, but there's been a lot of talk about them considering the rising cost of arbitration. And the role of a third party funder is, as it's mentioned here, would fund an arbitration or would fund even a mediation. And in, in return, if there is a collection, then that uh, um, funder would get a certain percentage from the collection. Now, there are main considerations um, in determining, you know, I mean, in any of those types of careers that I just mentioned, um, there are things that you need to, to do in order to, um, shall I say, succeed or, or yeah, I guess succeed in that kind of career. First of all is education. Obviously, you need to know more about ADR. You need to know what you're doing. And next, work experience. Of course, uh, as lawyers, we know, even as, as you know, new lawyers, we immediately r realize that the law is very different in practice. And of course, networking, just like um, in any other profession, you will have to network. Know that um, you need to have a good reputation and that other people should know you as a reliable, respectable, and ethical um, professional. But these are just some points for each item. Some questions that I get about education is you know, whether you need to undergo a specialized course. Do you need to have a Master of Laws in international arbitration or international dispute resolution? Do you need to have a doctorate for these? Um, do you need to get accreditation courses and certification courses or even a tribunal secretary um, accreditation course, which are all available out there? Um, I would say that you should at least understand what um, the law is. And that is why I told you to, at, uh, at the very least, read and understand RA 9285. On top of that, I would say that you, know, you need to learn more, not necessarily through attending uh, an LLM. You know, it can be quite expensive for, for many of us. Um, but you, know, you can take accreditation and certification courses. And later in the next slide, I will show you some of these courses that you can take um, without you know, going abroad. And these are all available in the Philippines. 
languages, it's, um, it's important if you are thinking of an international practice. Chinese these days is very important, very widely popular. Um, Russian, Portuguese. Legal qualification, do you need to be a lawyer to practice ADR? With, with um, Boy Castro earlier um, speaking, he's not a lawyer, he's obviously an ADR practitioner, so the, the obvious answer to this question is no, you don't have to be legally qualified to practice ADR. What is important is that, again, you understand the law, you understand the process, you also understand the, the best practices and, and you know the procedure. Um, and of course, you need to have a good reputation. Um, you need to get the party's um, trust and you know, they're confident that you can provide them the best service, just like any other, uh, just like in any other profession. So the trainings and workshops um, that can be accessed immediately in the Philippines is you know, the PDRCI does its um, mediation training webinar recently. It, it did a webinar recently on mediation. So if you know, want to learn more about mediation, there are available resources here in the Philippines. There are also arbitration training seminars. Um, some are provided by uh, the PDRCI. This other photo over here is one that was um, uh, a partnership with the IBP. I think it was about three years or four years ago, a, a partnership between the IBP and the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators. And then there's also um, the OADR. The OADR has uh, recently been providing a lot of webinars on ADR. Um, the whole spectrum of ADR from negotiation, even katarungan pambarangay, mediation, arbitration. The slide that you can see here is one where I spoke about um, an introduction, what I spoke about introduction to alternative dispute resolution and specifically um, arbitration. Now, how do you know about these events? Social media is the key. You can follow the social media of many arbitration organizations, and we will learn more about them later on. For instance, the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators has its Facebook page. If you follow the Facebook page, then you will be notified of ADR events. The, not necessarily those that are solely organized by the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators, but also events that are supported by the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators. For instance, recently, it, um, it co-organized the Regional Arbitral Institute's forum where there were a number of topics that were discussed. I discussed about the interplay between commercial arbitration and insolvency proceedings. So it is through these trainings and workshops that you kind of specialize on the types of issues that pop up in ADR. I mean, you learn about the law, you just know the law, but if you attend many of these workshops, then you will hear and listen to the actual practitioners who, who would be sharing their experiences to you. And, and it is something that I think you can also use in your own practice. So that's for trainings. Um, there's no excuse these days not to be trained. Trainings are available via Zoom, um, via MS Teams, and, and many of them are not just coming from, not just coming from the Philippines, or organized by Philippine stops. Um, you don't just stop. You need to continue this and at the same time try to gain work experience on ADR. Where do you get your experience in ADR? First and foremost is through your private practice, either through law firms or through your solo practice. Um, that is a place where you can begin incorporating ADR in your practice. In the next slide, we will be discussing more on how you can do that. Another is, you know, with your work in ADR institutions, you don't necessarily have to be employed by ADR institutions. There are other um, ADR organizations that accept internships. So if you are really interested, um, the ICC, the SIAC, the HKIAC, and all these other international arbitral institutions accept internships. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of work that, that you can get if um, short of being hired by these arbitral institutions. But I, I tell you the experience is worthwhile. And it, it, it's, it's really something that I recommend. 
You can also be working with neutrals, as mentioned earlier. Um, you can act as a tribunal secretary. You can act as an assistant to a neutral. You can work with them, and through that, you will learn more about ADR. You will be doing some work that uh, a neutrals themselves will be doing, such as drafting of procedural orders, or, or perhaps preparing a draft of an arbitral award, or assisting parties in preparing a settlement agreement. Next is being a neutral yourself. You know, be an arbitrator yourself, be a mediator yourself, being part of a dispute board. And I think you can do that if you are, I think first, if you are knowledgeable about the, the, the type of ADR uh, that you will be providing. Also, if you have uh, had some experience already, uh, whether as a, as a counsel or having worked in a law firm or having worked in an ADR institution or with other neutrals. Um, it's very, um, I would be very nervous appointing a neutral in, in my case, if the neutral has never had any experience either as counsel or as a neutral himself or herself. So it's really important to take note that you need to have experience before accepting any appointments as a neutral. Now, how do you incorporate ADR in your practice? Um, first and foremost, you, you can put there that you can put an ADR clause in the contracts that you review. Um, there, it, there doesn't have to be a dispute yet, but um, many, many of us, um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen ADR clauses in, in transactional contracts. Um, if we want to promote ADR, make sure that in, that in that DR clause, you put an ADR clause. Um, if there's no ADR clause, and only if appropriate, then consider drafting a submission agreement. So once a dispute has arisen, and then you look at the DR clause, and you see that there's no ADR clause, um, think, if, think whether the dispute is appropriate for ADR. And if you think it is, then you can suggest to the parties to enter into a submission agreement, whether going through mediation first, or negotiation, mediation, and then arbitration. Note that you know, do not suggest ADR only for the money and experience. Be mindful of your code of professional responsibility and lawyer's oath. We are administrators of justice, so please um, don't be that guy or girl. <laughs> so, um, of course, once you get the opportunity to provide an ADR service, whether as a counsel, whether as a neutral yourself, be sure that you provide the best service. And you learn this through workshops, experience and the adoption of best practices. Another thing is you should manage costs. Cost is a huge issue in ADR. And you know, make sure that you charge reasonably. Make sure that the your the, the your attorney's fees, your professional fees are um, appropriate for the amount in dispute, the complexity of the dispute. And please do not put a premium for ADR. I know of some ADR practitioners that would charge more if they are representing a party in an arbitration or they would charge more if they have been appointed as an arbitrator, um, much more than their regular rates as a lawyer. Please, um, that's something I personally frown upon and that's not, I, don't, I'm, I just don't agree with it. You might have your reasons, but if you can, please don't do that. Um, our service as a lawyer should be you know, similar um, all throughout, and we provide the same best service to the to our client. Know also the location, hearing rooms and meeting rooms. Uh, that's one way of managing costs. You don't have to fly to Boracay. You don't have to fly, fly to Hong Kong or Singapore to hold your hearings. You can do your hearings anywhere, and you are in a position to choose the most cost-effective location, hearing, and meeting rooms for your clients. Also, the fees of your neutrals and the ADR institution, just be mindful. If you have a small amount in dispute, you wouldn't want to put their, um, let's say, an international arbitral institution to be the administering authority because their fees, their fees are very, very high and not very cost effective. At the end of the day, we need to make sure that the parties have a good ADR experience because if parties will have an ADR experience, that's not a good way of promoting ADR. The ch chances are they will not go through another ADR in the future if they have a dispute. 
hopefully they won't have a dispute, but in case they have a dispute and they had a bad experience with ADR in the first place, you wouldn't expect them to undergo the same process again. So please, for us to promote ADR, make sure that we understand ADR, we provide the best service, we provide the best fees for our, for our clients, we provide the best service and make sure that the parties appreciate and have a good experience with ADR. Finally, just like with any other profession, you will need to network. You will need to network. Most of the time, um, Ay, these workshops, the most of the time, these okay. workshops would also give us an opportunity to network. So just attend events of arbitration organizations. You have their logos in the screen. You have the PDRCI, of course, um, the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, of course. We have the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, or the CI ARB. You have the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators. For arbitration, you also have the Philippine International Center for Conflict Resolution. And for mediation, you have the core group. You have the National Center for Mediation. It is very easy to Google these names, um, visit their websites, follow their social media so that you will be updated of their events. So these are just some of the photos um, of recent networking events that we've attended. Um, I just want to highlight also that because of COVID, many of these networking events are being conducted online. Um, it could be helpful if you familiarize yourselves with Zoom, how to use the various features of Zoom, and also um, connect through LinkedIn, through other social media. I would prefer connecting via LinkedIn than Facebook or Instagram. LinkedIn, if you're not familiar, is a professional social networking site. And uh, it's more appropriate to connect with professional contacts through LinkedIn rather than Facebook or, or Instagram. So if you have any questions, um, that actually concludes my presentation about careers in ADR. But if you have any questions, you know, feel free to you know, connect with me um, on LinkedIn and I'll be very happy to discuss um, and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony Santiago. I think uh, it's also the right time that we now have the Q&A. And uh, based on what the Secretariat has uh, submitted in the chat box, there is one question from the participant. Uh, if any one of the lecturers can respond to this. Assuming there is a contract that includes a provision which states that disputes should be settled amicably and only if the parties fail to settle after 30 days from notice, should there be recourse to arbitration. In quotes, PDRCI, for example, if a party files a notice of arbitration with the PDRCI, will arbitration be considered premature, therefore dismissible? Tony Panga, you might want to answer this. Or, uh, yeah, th thank you, Bing. Um, okay. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to have those kinds of uh, uh, provisions in, in uh, uh, commercial contracts. Um, typically, you would have a provision saying that the parties have agreed to uh, some form of uh, consensus-based process, such as mediation or negotiation, uh, within a fixed period prior to initiating arbitration proceedings. Almost always, the parties uh, uh, go through this particular provision uh, but if they don't, then that probably will uh, give rise later on to questions uh, when the arbitration proceeding is uh, instituted. Now, as to the particular institution before which the um, uh, dispute can be filed, if the uh, clause indicates a particular institution, then, then that is where you ought to file it. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, it does not state a particular institution then uh, uh, by definition that's an ad hoc arbitration so you now uh, refer that particular dispute directly to the other party in a notice for arbitration or a demand for arbitration um, i hope i answered that question maybe some of my uh, colleagues may want to add to that uh, either uh, jay or louis um none from me perfect answer <laughs> thanks jay. and from me as well <laughs> Thanks, Louis. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Panga. Any more questions? Uh, it's uh, 12 08. We have, uh, I think we all, we've uh, overstepped the time allotted to us. Uh, so we now, there's one more. Oh, there's one more from the chat bus. I think we will just entertain this last question. Will What will IDP do beyond this webinar to promote ADR and ADR practitioners and make ADR available to its free legal aid clients slash parties? I think this is this goes to Attorney Tayosa. Uh, thank you, Bing. We will continue to work with PBRCI and um, everyone in the ADR sector uh, first to uh, enhance competence, training, and capacity building uh, among our members and anybody who's interested in uh, ADR. Secondly, we're also endeavored to create the market for demand for ADR, and that would entail a lot of uh, information campaigns because our country our people even our brother lawyers must know and should know that the, the about adr so we the lawang approach as we train uh, and encourage lawyers to um, be well versed with adr its processes and its requirement we also try to create the demand for that uh, thirdly uh, for, uh, I now sit uh, in the uh, Office of Alternative Dispute Resolution for a chair the advisory board. We will encourage, we will guide the uh, OADR to uh, mainstream uh, ADR processes uh, in government. And uh, lastly, we are working with Congress and the Supreme Court for refinements in the laws and rules uh, governing ADR. We hope that as we put our minds and hearts together here, kayo mga experts sa ADR, our brother lawyers and uh, the general public, including the academic and uh, the uh, uh, justice sector uh, agencies, then we can envision uh, a regime where the parties are uh, able to resolve their differences uh, without going to court and are assured that there will be competent, dedicated, and most especially ethical ADR practitioners. So tuloy tuloy ho ito, next year we'll be sponsoring a series of uh, certification trainings. Um, we will uh, spend our funds for that, uh, free legal aid funds, uh, provided that the participants commit to uh, apply or at least uh, uh, attend to the ADR needs of our poorer Philippines. So, yun ang link ng IBP. Uh, this will be a continuing process. This is not the end. This is just an introduction. And we look forward and we hope that PDRCI will continue working with us on this aspect to mainstream it at the provincial and city levels. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, there is one more question in the chat box. I think this is the last question that we're going to entertain. But I don't know who among the lecturers should answer this because this is addressed to the Supreme Court. I'll just read the question. Should the Supreme Court issue rules requiring mandatory arbitration prior to filing cases involving structures last building construction issues? without contract provision on arbitration and inheritance or succession cases. Can anyone of the... Can, can I just uh, comment on that? Because, um, yes. our, I want to highlight that um, at least commercial arbitration, and I hope that is the context of this discussion. Um, in, in terms of commercial arbitration, the, um, as Louis has discussed earlier, it is a voluntary process. So um, for me, if we're talking about commercial arbitration, then it should be voluntary. There should not be a law that requires them to go to arbitration, even if the parties do not have an arbitration agreement. 
We've, we've had a number of issues already with mandatory arbitrations in our laws. And, and I think we can discuss that in a separate uh, webinar, uh, an entire webinar, we can have a separate discussion on that. But in general, arbitration, commercial, leave it voluntary. Thank you, Attorney Santiago. With that, I think uh, we now proceed to the virtual signing of the Memorandum of Agreement between IBP and PDRCI. Uh, may I respectfully call the attention of IBP President uh, Attorney Cayosa and PDRCI President Attorney Edmond Dutan. The witnesses are Attorney Maria Fe V. Galvez Garcia for the IBP and Attorney Salvador S. Panga for PDRCI. I'm here, Rabbi. Good morning. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, while we are uh, getting the signatories signed uh, and the witnesses signed the document, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, the memorandum of agreement between the IPP and the PDRCI formally seals the partnership between the two organizations in pursuing greater heights in the promotion of the use of ADR in the settlement of disputes and incapacitating the local IBP chapters through the conduct of pro bono ADR training. Bam or Jin, can we have a photo op for the signing for this? So we will be short of signing? Yes, sir. Uh, can uh, Jean or Bam uh, take the picture on the screen? We start signing. We will start signing. Yes, sir. Uh, you can start signing. Uh, it's virtual, so uh, we'll just uh, make arrangements for the exchange of documents later on. So, uh, thank you very much, sirs and madam. As the last part of the program, uh, as one famous proverb would say, all good things must come to an end. Here to deliver the closing remarks is uh, one of the founding members of PDRCI. He is the managing partner of Tan Akut Lopez and Tison Law Office. Secretary at the BDO Unibank Incorporated and at the BDO Private Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm very proud to introduce to you my uh, boss and PDRCI President, Attorney Edmundo Tan, for the closing remarks. Sir? Uh, thank you, Dean, for this uh, generous uh, introduction. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it has been a year ago that talks about this partnership between the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, IBP, and the Philippine Dispute Resolution Center, Inc., or PDRCI, has begun. Now, we are seeing the fruit of what we have planted together exactly in December of 2019, last year, when IBP and PDRCI met just to explore the possibility of partnership. I would say now that this partnership has become inevitable after the two year find common interests to address the issues and concerns relating to alternative dispute resolution or ADR. I tell you frankly, after I was advised to deliver the closing remarks for this roadshow this morning, I was not really sure whether what I'm going to say is up for what we have intended to do, because technically 
the signing of the Memorandum, Memorandum of Agreement, or MOA, which we just did a while ago, is supposed to open up the avenues for a deeper relationship between IBP and PDRC. So the signing of the MOA is just the beginning of our long journey together in the road less traveled in the field of ADR. Uh, by way of closing this roadshow, however, I wish to extend my sincerest thanks to the IBP leadership and the person of President Cayosa for giving PDR's partner in promoting and advocating the use of ADR as an efficient and cost-effective mode of settling disputes. The use of ADR in settling disputes is one of the better ways of making justice more accessible to the people. So, just to be very brief, I also would like to express my thanks to those who participated in this roadshow this morning. Maybe I have some Casimano there in Bacolod City, Negros Occidental. So, good morning to all. I hope to see each and every one of us not virtually, but actually, uh, sooner than later. But please, not in court. So happy holidays. Thank you, sir. And uh, one last photo off uh, requested by uh, the Secretariat. Can we uh, just stay for a while for the picture taking of uh, the uh, signatories, including the lecturers, Siguro? So that we can also document the proceedings. See it or see it, see SP Castro. Who's taking the picture? Uh, are you Bamba or Jean? Sir, I am. Um... Oh, okay. I don't know, smile. <laughs> <laughs> um, smile in one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Is it possible now if there's in, in MOA? Uh, hindi makikita yan. Eh, no? Nakikita ba? Yeah, ah, raise na, na lang po. Okay. Ready po. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir. And uh, okay. um, thank you, you, President Tan, being uh, yes, sir. and everyone. Thank you very much. I thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow, Mr. President. Happy yep. birthday, Louis. Birthday. Thank you, Jay. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Bye. Bye. Happy birthday. Bye. Bye. Ano? Nasaan na bang ilib? Bakit mo lang ilib? Bakit mo lang ilib?